Hi guys, and welcome to a Hector Lecture Guide to the Fight P8S Phase 1. This is Hephaestus. For this fight, first you're going to need spread positions. These can be your standard clock positions you used throughout all of the three previous fights. You also need to assign corners. These should always have a tank with a range and a healer with a melee so that you can have a natural in-out. You should also have a left-right priority for how to spread when in these corners. I stick with tanks, healers, left, DPS, right. That's facing inwards. So if you've got, say, main tank and off tank and you're wondering why are they on the right, that's because this is top down. Facing inwards, they are facing, they've gone to the left. You also lastly need light party positions. These should just be two groups and you should have a priority for a direction opposite each other. So in this case, group one are going to northwest, group two are going to southeast. One more position. Those same light parties need a snake priority. I have group one look at their usual spread position four and rotate counterclockwise to find a snake. Group two, look at A and rotate clockwise to find a snake. One more mechanic that I just want to explain beforehand. You've seen this in normal mode. Sunforge works by the boss making a fire animal appear, in this case a snake, and then doing a cleave. If you look carefully, the arena has black lines that show where these attacks are going to hit and where are safe. So the snake will always cleave the middle third of the arena via those black lines. Instead, if you get Sunforge with the bird, the bird is going to cleave the outer two-thirds, so the middle is safe instead. The fight begins with Genesis of Flame, which is a raid wide to heal and mitigate through. Next up, the boss is going to store either Conceptual Octaflare or Conceptual Tetraflare. Octa meaning eight means that all eight players get a spread AoE on them. Tetra meaning four means that only either tank healers or DPS get the spread AoEs on them, and instead they're partner stacks. The boss will cast Volcanic Torches, and everybody can position into their corners. Everyone is going to have exactly one of those white squares that will be safe within their quadrant. And the whole idea is to try to move into it before the volcanic torches go to full size and kill you. Here's how I solved this. Pretend you're main tank or R1 right now. Within your quadrant, there are four possible squares. The corner is always unsafe, every time. For the two that are on the outside, I'm looking here. If at any point in time I see one of the volcanic torches carve a blue line along these lines here, then I know that that square immediately is unsafe and I could ignore it. If by the end one of them is still safe, I go there. If by the end neither of them is safe, I stay middle. The volcanic torches are starting to get grown, and as you can see the north one's about to get a line above it, so that's unsafe now. As the volcanic torches finish, I realize that this line here has never been covered up, and therefore that is my safe spot. There's only ever one safe spot, so if that one doesn't get covered up, the middle is not safe, I have to move. Everybody does this within their own quadrant, and it works perfectly. What adds to a one extra layer of trickiness, I mentioned before the boss is storing either an Octaflare or Tetraflare. I'm going to show this as if he stored Octaflare, so the spreads. And also, while the vol volcanic torches are growing, the boss casts Sunforge and either shows Snake or Bird. Here we get Bird, which means that it's going to be in middle at the end. First, dodge the torches in your respective square. And now, because it's Bird and it was Octaflare, we're going to spread while in middle afterwards. This is quite quick timing, and if you have an unlucky pattern, healers in range, you might want to cast Sprint just to be able to make it a little bit easier to get to your spot in time. Afterwards, the boss does its Tank Buster, Flame Viper. This uh, is pretty ingenious by the developers. You can't invuln this. It's going to be two line OEs targeting the first whoever's got top aggro, so it requires a tank swap during the cast, but it gives both a bleed and a magic vuln up. If you try to invuln it and you take the second hit, the bleed on magic vuln will kill you the second your invuln drops off. Not, not just heavy, like if you invuln in the previous tank busters, straight up dead. So have first your off tank provoke, and then immediately afterwards the magic vuln falls off. Have your main tank provoke back, because the autos will kill your off tank otherwise. Reforged Reflection is now going to start one of two mini phases. This can either have the boss transform into a centaur or into a snake. When the boss transforms into a centaur, you need to pop knockback immunity or be positioned to get knocked back to a corner to not die to the wall of death. If the boss goes into a snake form instead, you need to be out of the hitbox. My recommendation for this, as soon as the boss floats in the air, pop knockback immunity. 
regardless of what it transforms into. If it transforms into a centaur, good, you want a knockback immunity. And if it transforms into a snake, there is more than enough time for you to get your knockback immunity back before it transforms into a centaur next. And so there's no harm, no foul. Position, pop knockback immunity, ready for whichever form it is. And if you see a snake, get out of the hitbox. In this case, it transforms into a centaur and everybody stays where they are, except for R2 who didn't pop their knockback immunity. The boss will now cast Rearing Rampage, and we need to be spread roughly for this. One advantage that you can have is there is room for a healer to be able to go towards the middle to make this healing check easier. We're about to get four sets of pretty hard-hitting raid wides. During each of these raid wides, two players will be targeted with a circular AoE that gives them an Earth Resistance down. If you get this debuff before it's your turn. So if you happen to stand in somebody else's AoE, when it's your turn to get hit by the spiky uh, rock, you will die to it instantly. So everybody needs to stay spread. Additionally, the order you get hit by these will matter for the next mechanic, so I recommend counting as these go along. As that first hit would happen on voice chat, I would say ones, twos, threes, fours. There's nothing visually other than the timer of when your debuff's gonna fall off to tell you which number you were after the fact, so make sure you remember, for this point here, I'm going to add these dots. They don't appear in the game. These are just to help to illustrate the mechanic. Now, the next thing that the boss does is stomp dead. This is four jumps that are baited by the furthest player away. It's not about how far they jump, but they have a circular AoE that hits where they land that can be soaked by two players. These can only be soaked if you don't have a debuff still. If your debuff is still on, the jump will kill you. Thus, for the first jump, ones need to be the furthest players away. Then twos need to be the furthest player away because their debuff's the only one that will fall off in time. Then threes, then fours. What I'm showing here is a simple way to solve this, but not by any means my recommended strategy for this. Instead, I strongly recommend that you try this uptime version of it. As soon as Stomp Dead happens, the players who were hit first are going to go to the one-way mark, twos go middle, and everybody else goes to B over on the east. This is the northeast or uptime strat for this. The boss jumps to one, and as you can see, the AoE is quite small. As soon as ones get hit, three swap. The boss will jump to the twos, twos and fours swap, jumps back to the threes, jumps back to the fours. Much easier to heal, way easier to keep uptime. Definitely do this version instead. Afterwards, the boss will transform back. Now I want to show you the other possible mini phase you could have had. So on the first transformation, the boss could have instead, when casting Reforged Reflection, turned into snake mode. As soon as you see that it's becoming a snake, get out as this comes with an AoE that fills the entirety of its hitbox. Max melee is fine. Stack up middle and prepare for Gorgamentea. I'm going to put the party list over on the side, and just to take a second, I've ordered this party list very particularly. I have the Group 1 tank and healer together, the Group 2 tank and healer together, the DPS from Group 1, and the DPS from Group 2 together. If you order your party like this, you'll make it much simpler to spot in a while whether or not you need to do any swaps. When Gorgamentea finishes casting, everybody gets two debuffs. The first is a one or two, which just says, are you the first group to do things or the second group to do things? And then everybody's going to get either an orange cone or a green snake. Here's how these work. When the adds spawn in a little bit, if you have an orange cone like main tank, you have a gaze attack that's capable of petrifying what you look at. Aim it at a player and they're petrified for about 10 seconds and are not going to be happy with you. Aim it at an ad and it petrifies them. We don't kill these ads with DPS. Instead, we kill these ads with the green snake debuff. If an ad is petrified, you can stand on that petrified ad to instant kill them with one of the poison puddles. This hits for heavy damage to watch player's health when they're taking the green puddle, whereas the gaze does no damage. Now, a reminder of our snake priorities. We're going to get snake spawning two at a time, and we need to make sure that tanks and healers go to separate ones, DPS go to separate one. Group one is looking at four and rotating counterclockwise. Group two is looking at A and rotating clockwise. This is to find the snake you're either going to gaze at or kill with a poison puddle. Right about now is a good time to check, do you need any swaps? So if you've ordered the party like I mentioned previously, look at the tanks and healers. It works out perfectly that the group ones have both a gaze and a kill, group twos have both a gaze and a kill. The DPS aren't so lucky. The DPS this time, both in group one have gotten the gaze and both in group two have gotten the kill. If we don't swap, both of the gazes are going to gaze one snake 
while both of the kills are going to kill the other one that's not petrified, and as a result, both will explode and kill us. As a result, we need to do a swap. My recommendation is, if you have this pattern here, where it's cone, cone, snake, snake, and either the tank healers or the DPS, you do a swap for that role. I'd have tanks or melees be the ones to swap. So in this case, M1 and M2 are going to just swap their priority. M1 is going to look at A and go clockwise. M2 will look at 4 and go counterclockwise. Everyone else does exactly the same as always. The boss will cast into the shadows, and we get two of those tunneling gaze uh, ads. One trick with this, ignore where they appear. When they appear, they're either going to turn clockwise or counterclockwise. This tells you whether or not they're going to stop on a cardinal or an intercardinal. If they turn clockwise, they're going to stop on a cardinal. Counterclockwise, they're stopping on an intercardinal. They will always end up all four snakes at the end on all cardinals or all intercardinals. Here come the snakes, and as soon as they turn counterclockwise, we know they're going to end on an intercardinal. Make sure to look away from them. Note that the timing's delayed here. The ads appear, then the gaze goes off, and now we get to work. First, the tanks are the first ones with the gaze attack. They gaze their ad, and then the healers step on to kill. Once again, we look away from the second set that'll be on the other intercardinals. And now, this time it's M1 and R1 with the gaze, and M2 and R2 with the kill. With all this done, stack up middle and heal up. Be aware, if at any point in time you don't kill an ad, they do cast what is essentially their version of an enrage that hits very hard. You can survive it with mitigation, but it gives everyone a damage down, so it's more or less just for prog's sake. Heal up and shield for ectothermus, which is a raid wide, and if you survive that, you're done with snake phase. After whichever transformation comes first, the boss is going to cast a mini mechanic, Illusory Creation. This spawns four clones of the boss on each of the cardinals. I recommend pre-positioning inside the middle square created by the black lines and being in with your corner with your partner. When the boss casts Creation on command, two of the adds are going to start to cast Sunforge. This will always be a snake and a bird, and they'll be perpendicular to each other. To make this easy, find the bird. The safe spots for this are always in line with that bird, so if the bird's on the east-west line, you move and dodge east-west. Stay within the black lines. Before this goes off, Manifold Flames is cast, and the boss is going to target either all tank healers or all DPS first with a flare attack. That's why we're spread in our positions. In this case, tanks and healers got hit. Whoever got hit should go to the nearest cardinal and stay out of the hitbox. The other four players are going to go in the hitbox at intercardinals. The reason we do this is the boss is now, without a cast bar, going to cast a line AoE at the four nearest players, and we need to make sure that none of the players who got a flare get hit by this. Simply, if you didn't get hit, you go in. Now, as this happens, two more Sunforged. This will always be either Double Snake or Double Bird. So the safe spot is either the middle square, or as we see here, all four of the outer squares. Give your healers a chance to top you up, as there's a huge amount of damage going out in this phase, and then head towards your square. You now get either Nest of Flame Vipers or Tetra Flare. Nest of Flame Vipers are spreads, but they're line AoEs centered on the boss. Tetra Flare are stack on your partners. Here it is with Nest of Flame Vipers. We're all in our outside corners via the black lines. And we dodge everything there. Just going to show you that same combo of mechanics, but what happened if you got the opposite roll on everything? So here the bird is on the north-south line, so we spread north-south within the black lines. Here's Manifold Flames, but targeting all of the DPS, so tanks and healers go in at the intercardinals, while DPS stay out of the hitbox and stay on the cardinal. Here we get double bird, so the safe spot will be in that middle black square. And here we get Tetra Flare, so everybody stacks on their partner in the corner. Immediately after this finishes, the boss is going to make a bunch of volcanic torches appear, starting from the north and the east always. Their pattern will only ever leave one safe spot in the corner. Here's how we solve this. Always look in the direction of the southwest or the three corner. If they go there and they turn towards two, so counterclockwise, you head towards four. If instead they head towards there and they turn clockwise towards four, you go towards two. If they head there, and both of them turn away as they get to the three corner, three is officially safe. 
Finally, if they both head towards three and they turn towards it to uncover it up like that, then your safe spot is one. There are no rotations or mirrors of this pattern. You can always look at three to be able to spot where the safe spot is. Wherever you get to, make sure you heal and mitigate for a Genesis of Flame raid-wide. And then the boss is going to start its next reflection mechanic. So if you had Centaur first, you'll get Snake. If you had Snake first, you had Centaur. Don't forget to pop knockback immunity. Either it's still on cooldown, but you don't need it, or it's off cooldown and you need it. Skipping ahead past that, as we've already seen how that first Centaur phase works, after you do both of the first two transformations, so Snake 1 and Centaur 1, the boss is going to load up either an Octaflare or a Tetraflare. They save this for later. I'm going to show you this as if it was the Octaflare loaded up, so spreads at the end. The boss casts four fold fires, and everybody stacks middle as there's proximity AoEs on the edge of the arena. Heal and mitigate through this. This hurts. Before we go into this, I just want to show you again, these were our light parties and their priorities. So group one in the northwest, group two in the southeast. We're about to get AoEs and their locations are just in the four corners of the puddles. So here's a bunch of different ways we could be spreading. If we're in the corner, I recommend doing it like this. Melees get the inside spot. Corners are for healers. Range go on the east-west wall and tanks on the north-south wall. If this is mirrored, everybody rotates clockwise, but again, tanks are still on the north-south wall, range are on the east-west wall, so it's a perfect mirroring of this. You can try to, if you want to, find a way to get both your tank and your melee to get uptime in this position, but you're going to have to basically get a GCD and nip out because there's just not room. It's tight. If both of the AoEs are on one side so that you've got north-south spreads, I recommend just taking your groups and sliding them in towards middle so both your tank and melee can get uptime. And lastly, if you've got them both on the north-south to so your spread on, say, like, all on the south, you can, if you want to, just stay in your corners. But if you're trying to get uptime, you need to do a little swap here. Have your tank and your range swap so both the melees and tanks are near to the middle while the range are on the wall. This has all been presuming Octaflare. If instead you get Tetraflare, which is a possibility, just have your tanks and healers collapse onto the DPS. There's always a sensible way of how to do this to get uptime. The boss will start by casting Chthonic Vent. Before this happens, if you're in group one, position your camera to look north so you can see both of the north two flames. If you're in group two, position your camera south so you can see both of the south two flames. The whole idea is that if you're looking north as a group one, and you can see these two, if one of them is not bubbling in a second, there's your safe spot, go there. If neither of them is bubbling, then it doesn't really matter where you go, just get up top. If both of them are bubbling, that's your cue to run opposite the way you're facing. Same thing for those players in the south. Look here, look at which ones are bubbling, and know your safe spot. Chthonic Vent goes off, and we get our first two that are bubbling, and so the groups adjust into safe spots. There's no need to spread, just get to the safe corner. Now the dragons jump around and show us our next two unsafe spots, and during this we get either a Tetraflare or Octaflare cast. Here it's Octaflare, so the groups are going to run across, and they're going to spread. We've done it once again in the uptime style positions. Our final safe spots, and we just need to get to them. There's no spread or stack during this, but to help with the future mechanic, preferably try to stick to your priority corners so you're already pre-spread to make the final mechanic easier. During this, you also get a Sun Forge. So dodge the explosion and look at whether or not it's bird or snake. Don't forget to remember back to what you had as your conceptual attack. Before this all began, the boss cast conceptual Octaflare, which means that everybody needs to spread. If it was Tetraflare, we'd stack on our partner. Everybody here has to go in for the bird while also spreading because of Octaflare, and the mechanic is done. You're going to get a Flame Viper Tank Buster combo. Deal with this exactly the same as before. Be warned that the next Flame Viper Tank Buster, the third one, hits a lot quicker than the second one does, which means that you won't be able to use your long cooldowns here if you want them back for then. It's less than 90 seconds between this and the next Tank Buster. You might want to consider even using an Invuln. It's still not going to help with the bleed, but it limits the amount of cooldowns and the amount of damage you're going to take when you're on minimal cooldowns. Next up, we're going to get another Reforged Reflection. Nice pattern with this. If you had Centaur first, this is going to be Centaur again. If you had Snake first, 
this is going to be snake again. You always get the, the second snake or center will always be the same as the first one that you got. So position for this. In this case, the group knows that we had centaur first, so they're going to pop knockback immunity as they know it's centaur. You cannot, for this transformation, cheese it like you did the first one. If he transforms into snake and you pop knockback immunity, it will not be back up in time for centaur. So make sure you either remember or pop knockback immunity only when you see it become a centaur. The boss will now cast one of two spells. Quadrupedal Impact is going to be a knockback from the direction the boss is facing. Run towards that cardinal. The boss will jump there and send you flying. If instead the cast is called Quadrupedal Crush, run away from where the boss is facing, this is a giant AoE. Either way, once you've survived this, look at the boss's cast. It's either a Conceptual Tetra Flare or a Conceptual Die Flare. Die meaning two is party stacks and Tetra Flare are the same light uh, partner stacks that we've had before. Remember this one, and I'm going to show it as Tetra Flare, which is the more difficult one. The boss now casts Blazing Footfalls. This is a combination of four hits altogether. The first one is always going to be a charge down the middle that sends you flying with a knockback. Note, these perfectly align with the black lines of the arena, so you can always position outside of the black lines to be perfectly positioned for the knockback. Before we know where to go, though, check the second attack. This can either be a giant AoE or a knockback. Here it was an AoE, so we can now position for our Tetra Flares along that black line to get pushed away from the AoE. For Tetra Flare pairings, you could just use your same partners that you've had throughout the fight, but I prefer tanks and melees together so that they can all get up time. The third mechanic is always a charge that goes perpendicular to the first one, and the fourth will be the opposite of the second. If we had AoE first, now we get the knockback. Now everything goes. The boss does its charge, we get knocked back, and the Tetra Flares go off. We can start running south because we're positioning for the third attack while the boss is going to do its AoE. We position now, ready to get knocked back for the fourth one, and during this, we're going to get some volcanic torches. The tricky bit is for that final knockback, we want to make sure that we're using it or riding it to dodge the volcanic torches. So watch, here comes the dash across. We look at where the volcanic torches turn, and we position to get knocked back away from them. There's time to adjust afterwards if you don't do this perfect, but you still need to get knocked sort of near to that outside safe spot. The boss will transform back, and it's done. Whichever phase you have first for this, so if you have Centaur 2 or Snake 2, the only thing in between is a Flame Viper Tank Buster. Again, your tanks might be lower on cooldowns here, so healers watch out. Now you get the final transformation, opposite of whatever you just had. So if you just had Centaur 2, this is now guaranteed to be Snake 2, and you can position out. The boss is once again going to cast Gorgamantea, and here's our party list in the same order I recommended before, and we get a lot of debuffs. We're going to do things a little bit differently for Snake 2. Here's how this works. Both players have both a gaze and a kill. The timers are set so that either all tank healers' gaze will go off first, or all DPS gaze will go off first. In this case, I'm showing it as if tank and healers have the slightly shorter timer, but if you're uncertain, just aim at the ad when your gaze is about to run out. For this pattern, we gaze at the ad, but we make sure the poison puddle is not on it. Then we swap. The DPS is now going to gaze at the ad to re-petrify it, and once again, we don't kill it with the poison puddle. Instead, we use it to survive the brand new debuffs that you see there. The purpley green snake debuff is a stack marker that also drops poison and can kill an ad. The orange circle, or brown circle, that's an omnidirectional gaze. You can't dodge it. You can't look away from it. It will kill you if you can't find a way to block it. That's why we've left the ad petrified. We're going to line of sight it. For those of you that have done Hydaelyn Extreme, this is very similar to what you did with the crystals. Whoever has the omnidirectional gaze goes outside behind the ad. Everybody else stacks up near to it, and the ad's petrified body is going to block this while the poison puddle then kills the ad. And that's how Snakes 2 is going to work. Before the boss casts into the shadows, I recommend that you pre-position like so, so you're already in what we call static snake positions. If you're like this, you will not have to move for essentially the entirety of the mechanic. The boss is about to spawn four adds all at the same time, and again, look at the way they rotate. If they go clockwise, they're going to end up on cardinals. 
If they go counterclockwise, they're going to end up on intercardinals. In this case, they rotate clockwise, so everyone knows to look at the intercardinals to avoid the gaze from them. At the same time, four clones of the boss shoot Gorgo spit line AoEs, but as long as you're in the middle four white squares, you dodge those naturally. Now we begin our combination of gazing and dropping our poison puddles to not hit anyone. So we stay exactly still. First, tanks and healers have the shorter gaze timer this time, so they aim at the ad. The boss will be casting Illusory Creation during this. And now the DPS aim at the ad. We re-petrify it, and nobody kills their ads with the poison puddle. The boss will have spawned a clone of itself. This clone is in line with two of the ads, and its line AoE that it will cast shortly is going to kill those two. We need to do our stack and omnidirectional gaze dance with the other two ads. Go middle for a second to heal up, and if you haven't yet checked, now is the time to look, do you need to do a swap? Same rules apply. If you and the other person in your group have the same debuff, then you need to do a swap. So here the problem is with main tank and H1. They both have the stack marker, but they're both group one, and therefore tanks need to do a swap. So main tank will go with group two, and off tank will go with group one. You go to your group positions based off of the group priorities. So group one goes north or west, group two goes south or east. And we make sure the gazes are outside and nobody is in line with the line AoE. I'm just gonna show you the same pattern again, but what happened if the adds were to spawn on the intercardinals instead? Still static positions. First, you would have dodged the gaze by looking at the nearest cardinal. You gaze at the nearest ad. And now DPS gaze at the nearest ad. Illusory Creation is once again going to spawn a clone that's in line with only two adds. And so we're going to go do the gaze, omnidirectional gaze, and the stacks over on the other two adds. Once again, heal up, and tanks still are doing their swap. And that's the fight. The boss is going to finish off by transforming back and casting one final raid wide at Genesis of Flame. Pop out all the mitigation you've got because there's nothing left afterwards. You then get two auto attacks to get the boss below 50%. If you do, you're going to get a cutscene, a checkpoint, and you get to go on to the really cool phase two of this fight. If you don't, the boss will become untargetable, cast another Genesis of Flame, and you will wipe. And that's everything to do for PHS phase one. Thank you so much, guys, for watching this guide. Please let me know in the comment section if you've got any tips, suggestions, questions, any things, other strats that you've seen that you think I should do a guide on. Really appreciate all your support, guys. Hope you find this useful. Thanks for watching. Take care.